This is the story of what made the Florida International University footbridge collapse. To understand what sadly happened, you have to understand the basic engineering of concrete construction. Concrete is a mixture of sand, pebbles and cement. It's been around for thousands of years. Probably first used by the Romans. A block of concrete is heavy, dense and strong, but it's only strong in compression, when the sand, pebbles and cement are squeezed together. It's also a dense and rather heavy material. The opposite force of compression is tension. This force pulls things apart rather than pushing things together. Concrete is brittle and weak under tension. The Miami Bridge engineers knew a concrete bridge is too heavy and too long to stand up by itself. It would crack in the middle under its own weight. For years, engineers have fixed the brittle nature of concrete by using steel rebar to absorb the tensile loads of any bending force on a brittle slab of concrete. A recent technique called post-tensioning lets the engineer use preformed concrete blocks with holes for steel bars made inside the structure. Post-tensioning has, according to a structural engineering magazine, only a cursory overview at engineering college. So, it is less commonly used than pre-tensioning construction using rebar. This is how post-tensioning works. A sturdy steel bar is placed in a hole down the center of a concrete beam. Two large nuts are placed on either end of the threaded rod. The nuts are tightened to squeeze the concrete beam and hold it in compression. The advantages of post-tensioning construction are the parts can be preformed, they are lighter, and they use less material. Pre-tensioning is mainly used in locations with a dry climate as rain and snow can corrode the steel bars. Another new technique was being used for the footbridge build. The bridge spans a major road, so closing the road for an extended period of time was seen as a bad option. The bridge was pre-constructed off-site and lifted onto its pillars by two mobile jacks under the bridge. The specifications clearly stated the mobile jacks need to be under each end of the bridge. On the day of lifting, it was found curbstones and a vehicle lane stopped the left-hand mobile jack getting under the bridge near its pillar. The construction crew repositioned the left-hand lifting platform nearer the center of the bridge. The right-hand jack was in its correct place. What that did was to stretch the steel bars under the weight of the left-hand side of the bridge, now left unsupported by the jack platform. The bars on the left-hand side of the bridge structure were becoming stretched and were near their breaking point. The engineering plan specified that the nuts tensioning the steel bars would be tightened after the bridge was lifted into place, making the whole structure stronger and squeezing the concrete beams under compression. So after lifting, the tightening of the bolts began. When the construction crew got to the left-hand side of the bridge, they found one of the nuts very easy to tighten by rotation with a hydraulic tool. 
This is when a discussion was held as to why this pretensioning bolt appeared faulty. Rather than stopping the build, the crew continued to tighten the bolt. All the time inside the concrete beam, the bolt was stretching longer and longer, having lost almost all its strength. Sadly, the road under the bridge construction was kept open, even though there was now a major problem. To know why there were so many casualties, you have to understand the layout of the road. Just past the new bridge construction is a traffic junction with lights. When the bridge broke, traffic was stopped, backed up at a red light. So, with no warning and nowhere to go, cars were crushed under the weight of the bridge collapse. Lessons need to be learnt. Budgets made large enough for safety margins. The public should never be allowed to be under a bridge during construction. The truth is out there.